Welcome to episode four of our basic design system series. Today, we're going to be adding effects. Let's jump in. In the file, I've laid out a few different things that I think could be useful. And as I always say, you can add more, add less, do whatever you want. But the first thing I want us to talk about is drop shadows. So in the file here, you will see how I've laid it out. And this is what I like to do. I like to keep them the same in terms of the direction they're coming from. So you'll notice that all of the X's are zeros. Then I've made the Y increase from one to the other. So you can see how it like at the bottom, you can see more and more of the shadow and the blur as well. I've kept it. I've started it off quite big. I see a lot of times that people have very, very small blurs to begin with, and that's fine. But I kind of like that it feels really spread out. So 16 for the first one, then 30, then 44. With the spread, I like to keep it on a minus. What the spread does, and this is actually a really good trick in general when you're trying to figure out the drop shadow, sometimes because firstly, you have the bounding box that's selecting it. And also because the colors are very light, it's hard to see what's happening. What I like to do is just bring the color up to 100 and then you can really see the differences in what you're doing. And then I'd go even to the extremes. So if I wanna see what is a minus, spread even do make it like minus 20 can't see anything right maybe make it like a minus 10 okay so I see it's creeping in from underneath and then do the other way make it 40 okay I see that it's going really big like that fine so I now kind of understand more what spread does I really recommend using that technique with anything that you're trying to figure out what's even happening go to the extremes and then you can see it really really clearly so I'll bring it back to a minus four. And I kind of like that it's spreading from a minus because it's almost spreading from the, like from the middle of it out or like even like crossing itself in the middle because it's a minus. If, if I do it on even a small number, like a two, you can see that it's a bit harsher. I know that we're on hundred percent, but still. So I'm going to keep it on minus four for all of them. And then with the opacity as well, starting from a 10 and then moving very slightly up. Even on my biggest elevation, I don't want it to be crazy. I don't want it to be like a uh, 50% in the uh, opacity because it's just too strong. So you wanna keep it small. Now with a drop shadow, it also depends what you're going to be using this for. If you're on a website, I think that a spread like a blur of 44 is fine. But if you're using this on a smaller device, 44 is just gonna to be too big, yeah? Let me just show you. If I bring in just an iPhone into here and I'll just copy this over. You'll see how, yeah, it's not like it's taking over the screen and also this is small. But if this was, let's say, we usually have 16 pixels of gap. So something like that, you see how it looks so elevated on top of the like on top of the screen. It's almost too much. So I wouldn't use that big of a drop shadow on mobile. I would use it on web though. On mobile, we can use slightly more nuanced drop shadows. So these are the drop shadows that I'm going to add into my library. Now, this might be a bit controversial, but we are in a basic design system series. So I'm not gonna use variables for any of this. What? If you want, you can definitely put all of these numbers and the colors into variables, but I don't think that's necessary in this case. So I'm just gonna make styles, good old styles. So I will select the element that already has the effect on it, go into my four dots, click on plus, and then just add it. So I'm gonna wanna call it drop and then small. Remember that the slash creates a file. Now, it, technically the way effects are saved as styles is that they're saved under the different things. So like if they're drop shadow effects or a blur effect or anything like that, they'll be saved into different categories, but I still like to name them so I know what they are. So I've got drop S and then this one is going to be drop M and then this one is gonna be drop L. Great. And now if I just add in like a square into here, I can see if I go into my effects that I've got all my drop shadows neatly stacked over here. Wonderful. Let's add another effect into our library and that is blur. Now what I find most useful with blurs is actually to use them with a gradient in order to create like a, a gradient effect that isn't harsh. I never find a reason to use normal blur, especially now when we have glass. We're gonna do glass later. Um, but blur on its own, never. So I'm doing a blurring gradient hybrid. Now, again, we only need three in my opinion. And what I've done is created this sort of thing where we have an extra small that is just a gradient. So you can see it on top of an image. And I used it on top of the image because in my personal experience, this is the only time I ever use these things. So on top of an image, and you can see that you can see the image coming through behind it a little bit. 
And all I've done is created a linear gradient on top of it that goes from 100 to 75% opacity. Now you can see that it's a very small change in opacity, only 15%, but it still makes a big difference. So if I change that to like 50, it's almost too much for what I'm looking for. So 75 is enough. Now with a small one, I have added a bit of a progressive blur onto it. Now progressive blurs are relatively new in Figma and they're amazing because they're doing something that we always pretended to do before or we're just kind of lacking. You can see that I've upped the gradient on here as well. So you might say, well, it's just a gradient. You're not actually, what's the blur adding? But it is adding because if you look at the ending here, it does look more like it's blurring into an environment. It's almost like a bit of a feathering effect. If I take it off, so I'll just remove the effect. You can see that it's a much harsher line. You might want that sometimes, but if not, you've got your little layer blur here to help you out. And then the medium one, which is a bit more than a medium, maybe it's a bit of a large, it's almost, the, the gradient is 100 to zero, so the color completely disappears, and also the blur. I know it's only 10, so it seems really small, and on a bigger element, it will not be as, disappearing as this but still i wanted it to be really like this effect of it's going away so you have some color and then it completely disappears by the end of it and again if i turn off the effect you will see that i can still see the line where the end of the element is and i don't want that that's why the blur now you'll notice that we have two of these got one going up one going down and that's how i'm going to save them and again i am not going to use now for this one, I am actually going to use variables. So what I'll do is I'll go into my variables and then I'll do this on the primitives. I'll create a new group onto here. So just in normal variables, create a new one and I'll call it gradient and then slash to create the group. And then the first one is extra small. So I'll add that one let me find the group um and then you can't save both of the colors and i know i already have the 100 percent. so all i need is the 75 the 25 and the zero so this one i'm going to make it with 75 percent opacity then i will shift and enter to create a new variable this one will be a small and this one will be 25 percent opacity and then the last one is going to be medium and it's going to be zero percent opacity the reason that i put this in as a variable is so i have dark mode and i'm going to add a little asterisk here because we're going to come back to this because sometimes in dark mode you are not going to want this to swap and I'll show you how to tackle that later. But let's, for now, just for the fun of it, let's make this one, uh, all of these black, and then exactly the same, this one, 75, this one, 25, this one, zero. I'll add one more variable into here. I'll just call it full, um, and this is going to be 100%, and this one's going to be 100%. I, I, I don't know why, maybe I'll need it eventually. So I might as well do that. Last thing I'll do is I want to scope these out. So I'll select all of them and edit. And I only want to see them in fills and not for text, just for shapes and frames for now. Um, I'm only going to use them inside of a fill and then save them as a style anyway. So let's just keep it at that, just so it doesn't muddy the waters of all of my color selections. So I'll go into my fill here. And then in here, libraries, I'll look for gradient. It's right at the top. I need the extra small here. And then for my 100%, I need my full. And then I'll just keep doing that. Once I've done one direction, I can actually copy the properties. So command option C and then paste them, command option V. And then if I go into my linear gradient here, I can just use this to flip it. So, slip it, so flip it to the other side. And then here, I actually just paste this in and then change it. So instead of using small, I will use medium. Copy that over, paste it here and flip. Great. Now by doing that, we have now protected ourselves into dark mode. So if I select this whole section, go into here and then change it to dark, you'll see that it flips to being black. Now, the reason I say that I don't always like to do it this way is because I do tend to use this sort of effect on top of images 
and the image won't change when you're in dark mode. So let's say this is the situation right now and I'm gonna put a bit of text on top of it. And so you can see this is how it looks in dark mode. I've got some white text on top of the black background and it's like this. And then if I change it into light mode again, you see that. So that, it's kind of one of those things where I don't necessarily need it to flip when it's in dark mode. It would kind of be fine for it to stay like this even if the rest of the phone is dark. So that's one caveat of where are you actually going to use this and how are you going to use this? So just keep that in mind. Now I need to save these as styles. So the way I'll do that is I'll actually, I'll save my gradients as well as my blurs. So for this one, I'm gonna add a new style and I make sure that I'm on style and not on variable. And I'm actually going to call this blur. Yeah, even though it's not a blur, but it's for my blurs. So it'll be blur slash extra small. And then this one is going to be blur slash small up. This one is blur slash small down, blur slash medium up, blur slash medium down. And then I'll also save my layer blurs. So I will go into my small ones and I'll save this one as blur small up. And then in my description, I can say use with gradient. Yeah, just so I have that little note in case anyone else is using this. And here as well, I'll call it blur slash s down. Now you see that I have them here inside of my effects. Now, as I said before, the effect styles do get a different, like the way they look is different if they're a blur effect, if they're a drop shadow, but I would still group them as well just to keep it really neat and tidy. And those were our blurs. Now let's add our last effect, which is glass. Glass is very new to Figma. It's still in beta as well. It came in after the announcement from Apple of iOS 26, which just includes liquid glass onto your phones very controversial, not going into that, we'll do a separate video on that. But let's see how to use this effect on Figma because it's actually very cool and could be really useful even for just a simple design system. Little note on this though, if you are designing for something that isn't an Apple device, I have no clue if anyone can actually develop this on something that's not Apple. So worth having conversation with your developers, if this is going into development, about can you include glass in your designs and can they achieve this? Because if not, and you're gonna make really nice designs and they can't actually fulfill this, really sad. So talk to your developers. They're nice people at the end of the day. This is, again, one of those that is going to be used over something. So you really wanna see how it reacts when it's something in the background. In glass, we have a few different properties. First property that we have is looking at the light angle and the light kind of strength. So it's automatically set to 45 degrees and the intensity of 80, but I'll just show you if I move it around, you can see it doesn't have a stroke on it, by the way, it's just the um, the light kind of moving around it. And you can see here, it says scrubbing at, it's, it's, I guess it's still like processing all of it, but I would keep it on 45 because that's kind of a good angle, I guess. It also kind of matches with the angle that we used earlier for drop shadow, so that's good for me. And the intensity as well, you can make it really high or really low, but 80 is the default, so I'd stick to that. In order to use glass, by the way, it almost automatically adds a fill color with 10%, so just keep it like that. Then we've got the refraction, which is how much the glass kind of effect is refracting. And what I've done is that I've lowered it bit by bit throughout my stages. So extra small has very high refraction and then it goes down bit by bit. I've not moved the depth and the dispersion. The dispersion is what creates like the different colors as it breaks. So if I just, I don't know if you can see it with this picture, but yeah, you can't really see it too much because I guess with the image and also the dispersion, refraction and depth almost change each other. But I've kept them as is. I don't think you need to play with it too much. Same with the depth. You will be able to see the depth in action when it happens. If I like up this and up this, you can actually see like a bit of a rainbow happening here because of the dispersion, but I'll just lower it down. We don't need it to be too high. That's not what we're going for. This glass effect is useful to just create that frostiness, that something on top of something. It's very similar to what we can achieve with the blurs and the 
linear gradient, but it is a bit cooler when it moves around and you can see the elements kind of breaking at the edge of it. So what I've really changed between them is the refraction and the frost. So the frost is what it is just what it says on the tin. It's just the frost. Yeah. So if I up it, you'll see that it's you kind of can barely see anything behind it. And if it's completely down, you only see that breaking, that dis that dispersion and that refraction. So we want to have at least a bit of frost on there, I think, just to just to keep it um, something that you can have something on top of and it still be legible. But yeah, so that's what I've done. Now let's save these as our effects. So I'll add it into here. I'll call it glass slash is extra small small and medium and that's that so you'll notice in my effects i've added my blurs my drop shadows and my glass i would really recommend whatever naming convention you're using use the same across and especially if you have let's say four of each kind then always call them extra small small medium large or call them one two three four or whatever you're using don't suddenly change it in between and if you have the same amount if I have four here four here and four here make sure that it matches up so don't have one that starts from extra small and one that starts from extra extra small because you'll just confuse yourself with it so make it simpler for yourself and anyone else that's using your design system. And that's that. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know what other videos you want to see in this design system series or in other series. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you at the next one.